So I would just like to start this preface with saying um, this was initially going to be like a you know fun and quirky. I'll just react to this. It'll be fine. Um, but it turns out my incurable curse that I thought I got rid of as a child is still around and I am still the queen of, well, actually. <laughs> so it turned into a long rant. Um, obviously no hate to this woman. She's, you know, studying her field and she has some genuine great insight to offer. Um, I just know from personal experience that a lot of A-spec issues are overlooked and very um, lacking in the research department, yet no less true and real. <laughs> I'm also going to be using certain terms you may not be familiar with. So, hi, I'm Anna. I'm Aeroes. Basically, that means I am aromantic and asexual. Um, you can be one without the other. Um, or you can be a combination of both, like myself. So, asexual means you feel little to no sexual attraction, and aromantic is the romantic attraction version of that, where I feel little to no romantic attraction. I also use terms like aspec, that's aromantic slash asexual spectrum, that means all of it. If you are not anywhere on that spectrum, that would make you allo. You can be allosexual or alloromantic or some combination. And then there's ace spec, asexual spectrum, and aerospec, aromantic spectrum. I also use the term amatonormativity, which is the... Let me look up that actual definition so I get this right. Amatonormativity. Amatonormativity is the set of social assumptions that everyone prospers with an exclusive romantic relationship. Professor of Philosophy Elizabeth Brake coined the neologism to capture societal assumptions about romance. Describes the term as a pressure or desire for monogamy, romance, and or marriage. The desire to find relationships that are romantic, sexual, monogamous, and lifelong. It puts stigma on single people as incomplete and pushes romantic partners to stay in unhealthy relationships because of the fear the partners may have of being single. One way in which the stigma is institutionally applied is the law and morality sound surrounding marriage. Loving friendships, queer platonic, and other relationships are not given the same legal protections romantic partners are given throughout marriage. So definitely check out Elizabeth Brake's book, um, Minimizing Marriage, where she talks about that and coins the term. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah, and you'll also see me change shirts, um, because I didn't finish filming it. So there's that last portion, um, we're gonna wrap up the video and I'll be wearing this shirt. So here we go. Hello and welcome to the friend zone. I'm your Airways host, Anna. And today I'm going to be looking at biological anthropologist answers love questions from Twitter. This is something I picked because I figured, uh, historically, <laughs> aromantic and asexual issues are not exactly, um, known to exist. <laughs> I'm expecting something fairly... phobic potentially, or just ignorant. Um, I'm just fascinated. I wish that even alloromantic, allosexual people knew how much modern normativity affects. <laughs> because it's kind of poisonous to everyone. Uh, specifically, you know, it's a lot easier to notice when you are inherently an outsider to those things from birth. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why it makes it so difficult to know um, that you don't experience that kind of attraction when you're never taught that that's an option. Because um, it's always when you get married. There's the question of, oh, well if you're not straight then I guess you're gay. Or perhaps even buy her pan. Accidentally stumbled onto a pride festival in the park at uh, Salem, and I was the only person there with anything visibly arrow. I have my little arrow pin hat. So anyway, let's see, uh, 
how this goes. Hi, I'm Dr. Helen Fisher. I'm a biological anthropologist. I study love, and this is love support. And we all carry in our head what I call a love map. Wrong already. I do not have that. <laughs> but the moment comes, you're ready to fall in love. Wrong again. I don't think anyone is ever ready to fall in love. From what I've observed, it's... It doesn't seem like a good time for anyone, actually. I mean, like, it's fun and exhilarating, but like... I don't know, when people explain that they're like, I was in love instantly. I couldn't sleep, my heart was racing, I was sick to my stomach, and I think about them every second of every day, and every time that I'm not around them, I want to die. I'm like, that doesn't sound fun. But they're like, no, no, it's the best experience on earth. Um, one I'm glad not to have. Uh, most times, you know, comes and goes. Think if romanticism were a little more mainstream, uh, then there wouldn't be so many feelings of guilt, shame, or missing out um, attached to it. <laughs> yeah, Jill, they say something that's funny or charming or interesting, and boom, instantly trigger that brain circuitry uh, for romantic love. Attachment, that other brain system, grows slowly. You have to get to know somebody to begin to feel attachment, but romantic love can be instant, yes. I tend to think of romantic love as attachment. That's another thing I see a lot, um, is the complete underutilization of the split attraction model, or SAM. It seems like that instant draw is typically more like sexual attraction, where you see someone and you think they're hot or they're cute, um, and you want to get to know them better. And for some people it isn't, you know, a split feeling, but I think there's a lot more in depth that, based on the fact that she's not even acknowledging it, I think it's just so far out of her field, it can be a hard thing to get to. And it's bizarre to me that someone who is so well studied as to consider themselves qualified could be missing out on such an essential part of something that I've picked up from observation, which is not to say that I'm any more of an expert or even an expert, but I feel like there's something key and crucial that uh, Dr. Helen Fisher seems to be missing here. Who created love? This shit is too much to handle. Well, love evolved. For millions of years, we have form partnerships, pair bonding, or monogamy. 97% of mammals do not pair up to rear their young. People do. It's a hallmark of the human animal. And I would not say it's a hallmark of the human animal. I think it's something that has become normalized and was only really normalized in cultures. The truly, you know, monogamous relationship. You move out, you have your kids, you live alone with one other person and your children. And that's more of the nuclear family ideal. And that's something that is actually just a fairly recent development in human history. Unfortunately, and you're going to hear me rant about this, you know, more and more, but <laughs> it all ties back into the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, patriarchy, systemic issues, and also the fear of the other um, as a way to exclude cultures, and lifestyles that are foreign and different, um, that raise children communally, or where multiple partners or not, you know, pair bonding is more common or accepted. And I think it's just a natural part of humanity. That's also why aromanticism, um, alloy aromanticism, is demonized as well as being heartless. You know, you see that a lot with, um, you know, common tropes of, oh, they're an abuser, they're awful, they only have sex, they don't have romantic feelings, and they ditch people. And it's kind of rude of you, you know, to ditch people if you were leading them on into thinking that they had romantic chances with you, but honestly just discussing it that's a good thing. That's perfectly normal and healthy. It frustrates me that so many people 
even in the A-spec community, still demonize allosexual aromantics. <laughs> and honestly, like, it's just a natural part of humanity. Like, sex is just a normal thing that you can do with your body. You know? You brush your teeth, you jump rope, you work out, you have sex, whatever. Those are all just choices you can make that affect your body hormonally or keep you healthy. And there isn't that moral aspect to it. I think that's very much a human creation, but specifically by certain people. <laughs> you know, it's not... That morality isn't inherent, isn't real, it's a social construct. <laughs> And I'll be interested to see actually how she goes into this more. I and my colleagues have put 15 people into a brain scanner who had just been rejected in love. And the brain goes, just the wiring just goes crazy. I, was somebody I wonder how that would compare to romantic rejection and regular rejection. Because I think if something is important to you, it's devastating either way. And a lot of people put value on their romantic relationships. So I would like to see a better study of 15 people who've gone through romantic rejection, 15 people who've gone through regular rejection, or like more specific categories and see how that's broken up and what those have in common or if there are differences. I mean, people pine for love, they live for love, they kill for love, and they die for love. And I think that's unhealthy. No matter where you stand, no matter what your orientation or attraction, friendships are important. Or hobbies are important, or any mix of that. Like, life does not depend on love. Love does. Life does not depend on sex or interest or even other people. For me, I don't even feel that. You know, I'm unusual amidst my fellow Arrow Aces, Aspect people. I'm unusual amidst my peers, and that I'm probably closer to aplatonic. Um, I don't really feel that compulsion to be friends with people. I really like my friends, but I'm not, I don't focus in and, you know, like, I have to be their friend or I want to get to know more about them. I'm just not that naturally compelled. And I feel like people base so many things on their relationships to others that they forget to be themselves. <laughs> that they're a person outside of comparison and contrast to others. And as also someone with depression, I want to find that meaningful hobby or have that something outside of reliance on other people, but I don't, I don't know what that is yet. And even within the ASPEC community, there's such a, such an emphasis on, I am this, but I still feel I still love my friends. I still love my hobbies, love my cat. And it's like that feeling of trying to make up for your horrible deficits. I am awful, but at least I'm this. And that's not true. <laughs> you don't, there isn't a void in your soul that makes you wrong, makes you off, that you have to make up for it all. It's just who you are, and that's good, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to make up for who you love, who you don't love, what you feel and what you don't feel. It just is. And how you feel about that is more important. And when this person says, this shit is too much to handle, but we all do handle it. We don't all handle it. But yes, the vast majority of us do get over it. <laughs> and I've been able to prove in the brain that time does heal because it is our survival. It is a survival mechanism. It evolved millions of years ago and it will be with us millions of years from now. The brain is very good at making up different ways to cope and continue to survive. <laughs> That's a really interesting topic um, to look into unrelated to ASPEC issues, but... Um, looking into Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID. Um, that's really fascinating. And if no one ever had to go through, you know, such awful trauma, you know, I'd wish for that. But it is just fascinating and awesome to see 
what the brain does with that, or how it can compartmentalize itself, or take in different aspects and of its surroundings, and give the person the trauma is affecting a way to bring in the help they would need from others but can't get. And I think that's really fascinating as well. Romantic love is primordial, it's adaptable, and it's eternal. It's not this all-consuming, wonderful, primordial force. I see it more as a scientific... I mean, it's awesome and good for the people who feel it, but... It's not the end-all, be-all, magical, most magical force on Earth. Here since the dawn of time and its glorious wonder. It's not magic, it's science. It's chemicals in your brain, and they're good chemicals. The human brain is not built to deal with more than about five to nine options. After that, the brain just uh, spaces out. You, you choose nobody. What's so bad with choosing nobody? Is after you've met nine people, and that's what this person needs to do. That's another confusing way to word it, after you've met five people. What does that mean? Because from what I've observed of Tinder and such, you don't so much meet people <laughs> as you get sent a billion inappropriate photos, sigh, and then turn off your phone, and then swear you'll never go on Tinder again until you get lonely weeks later, and then you go back and repeat the same process until you meet one or two people you can actually have a conversation with, but they're not that deep. So what do you define as meeting someone? And get to know at least one of these people better. The more you get to know somebody, the better you tend to like. Number one, don't binge. Number two, think of reasons to say yes instead of no. We have this big brain region linked with negativity bias. We're built to remember the negative. And when you have just met somebody, you know so little about them that you overweight those few things that you know. And so you'll say, oh, I don't know. She likes cats. I like dogs. Never going to work. Get over it. Think of reasons to say yes. I call it positive illusions. The ability to overlook what you don't like about somebody and focus on what you do. That's another interesting proposal. I can see where it's coming from. Like, be less judgmental. Gets you a lot of places in life. Be more open-minded. Yeah. That is good advice. <clears throat> However, if you're getting bad vibes from someone, you can always say no. A lot of the times, especially with women, or anyone who was socialized as a woman, it's easier to deflect and never truly say no. And I feel like that's not only bad advice, but just dangerous. Like, that's how you meet serial killers. There are certain standards. If it's more a head thing of superficial differences, then yes, learn to move past that. If it's uh, it's probably fine. He said this in his bio, but it's probably fine, and then you end up dead in a ditch. Then, like, better to have missed a potential romantic opportunity, and also have skipped being murdered. If connection is something you want, that will come to you. Like, everyone is lovable, and I promise you that. Um, it just has to do with timing and change. So if you do want someone, or someones, they're out there, but forcing it also isn't good. <laughs> you know, these are different brain systems. Sex drive and romantic love are different brain systems. And you so she does acknowledge that. That's good. You can be madly in love with somebody and also sleep around. As a matter of fact, I do think that the brain is unfortunately built for both. Unfortunately built for both. Interesting wording. We seem to have the ability to be madly in love with some person and deeply attached to that person and also sneak around. I call it a dual human reproductive strategy. A tremendous drive to fall in love, form a partnership and have your babies and also to cheat. I wouldn't say it's a drive to cheat. Again, just based on my observation. I don't know. I feel like so much of this is based on, especially like from you know, my limited American perspective, it is culturally Christian. And that is something that denies sexual feelings and 
loves monogamy, even though it's not really a natural part of human life. And I'm not saying, you know, everyone is built for polyamory. It's not like that. But I think there's just such a lack of discussion and such a taboo on these subjects that you're culturally expected to get married and then have sex. And that's the one person that you're latched to forever and they're your everything and they can take care of your every need all the time. And people just aren't like that. You can't put that many, you can't stack that many hopes on one person. And I think if there were a lot more discussion, there are truly loving relationships where if you need something else in more of a sexual manner, you can be with someone else. And that person that you're, you know, partnered with romantically, you can both seek different options and still be truly in love. <laughs> and I think if that were less of a taboo, cheating wouldn't be such a thing. I mean, most of the time cheating is awful, and it's a really scummy thing to do to someone. But I think because there's such a lack of communication, people seek out those options and get stuck in relationships that don't suit them, either of them because they are so convinced that that's what one must do. And it's cruel for both people involved. <laughs> Google search. How does attraction work? <laughs> that was a lot of my Google search. Uh, sometime in middle school. <laughs> that's another thing that's difficult about even learning that you don't feel a certain type of attraction because one, you're never told that's even an option. And two, how are you supposed to know if you are not feeling something if you have never felt that something to compare it to? Why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? There's all kinds of cultural reasons that uh, we tend to fall in love when the timing is right. We tend to fall in love with somebody who's around. Proximity is important. We tend to fall in love with somebody from the same ethnic and socioeconomic background, somebody of the same level of education. And there's four basic brain systems that each one of them is associated with a constellation, a suite, a group of personality traits, dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen system. If you're very high on the traits in the dopamine system, risk-taking, novelty-seeking, curious, creative, you tend to be drawn to people like yourself. If you are very high on the traits of the serotonin system, you tend to be traditional, conventional, follow the rules, respect authority, detail-oriented rather than theoretical. Well, with all of that with serotonin, I can understand why I'm the way that I am, because, boy, that serotonin is lacking. Well, if you're very high testosterone, you tend to be analytical, logical, direct, decisive, good at things like math, engineering, computers, music, music's very structural. I'd also wonder what levels and distribution there is with testosterone and estrogen in people and whether those are inherent, those sort of logical analytical traits are inherent to two levels of testosterone or if there are people with higher testosterone or assigned male at birth bodies that are thought of as more logical or it's fostered that they're more analytical or good at things. I'd want to know more of a whether it's correlation or causation. People, and this is men as well as women, many more women in that category. Very good at reading posture, gesture, tone of voice. We all Once again, posture, gesture, tone of voice. When you're socialized female, you're taught more to be caring, be empathetic, even if that's against your nature. Um, to pay more attention to social changes or facial expression, posture, and to be able to read that. And there's also, once again, a higher danger of misreading that and getting hurt. I don't know. I wanted to go into more of the detail on it. Express all four systems. This is what the problem is with most personality questionnaires today. They put you in one bucket or another. We express all four people are multifaceted brain systems and the traits in each, but we express some more than others. Now, there's all kinds of circumstances where people are drawn to their opposite in ways because if they had a bad love affair, or they've been running around all their lives and now they want something more stable so they go for the traditional, even if they're very risk taking. There's human variety, but the bottom line is there's patterns to culture, there's patterns to nature. 
and there's patterns to personality. Bad short friend too. Uh, how does someone love your username by the way? <laughs> know if they're feeling romantic or platonic attraction this is the question i'm most worried about her answering um but this is also the one they use in the thumbnail and what drew me to this video initially time to play the fun game does this get super aphobic or not there's a, a liberal list of traits that are associated with feelings of romantic love and they are not associated with platonic attraction. The first thing that happens when you fall in love is somebody takes on special meaning. You can absolutely have special meaning for your friends. Everything about them becomes special. The car they drive looks different from every other car in the parking lot. The house that they live in, the street that they live on, the music that they like. When it's a plutonic attraction, not everything is special about this human being. You. It could be. You can absolutely feel extreme devotion and care for your friends, and it doesn't have to be romantic in any sense like them i mean you're attracted to them you find them amusing or funny or interesting but you don't you, they don't, you don't you're not obsessed with them but if, you can also be in love without being obsessed with someone if you had to think about one just one trait that is most distinctive between the two when you're madly in love with somebody in a romantic attraction you are obsessed and i don't think that's right i think there's a certain level of interest but you can feel romantic attraction and not be, not have it consume your everything. That's not an inherent facet of life. And in a plutonic attraction, you don't think about them night and day. This person is reprogrammed coach, is online dating killing romance. Can't kill romance. This is a basic brain system. It evolved millions of years ago. It's like hunger or thirst or anger or fear. You can't. I would say that connection is that basic thing. Most people feel that sort of connection and care for others. I don't tend to feel connected, but I do like people. So I'm still figuring that out about myself. But romance is, once again, a social construct. It's built based on ideals of what romance is. It's kissing, it's flowers, it's sending flowery notes and perfume and standing in the rain with a boombox or whatever. This video frustrates me because she is so close to the truth, and yes, it's heavily edited and it's wired and it's made for the mainstream, but when you have something that is, you know, viewed by nearly three million people, it feels like there's required reading that goes into it, and there are no links, there's no backup, there's no citation, um, and I feel like all of this is very much citation needed. Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy on just one individual at a time. And it's also not specific to mating energy. What a creepy way to put that. But yeah, like, ace people absolutely exist, um, and you can have romantic love without sexual feelings. Which disproves the idea that it's that love is some like poisonous, deceptive thing that tricks you into having children and caring for them. Ugh. Like that's not real. <laughs> that's the cynical and false way to see it. But you can absolutely feel sexual attraction and romantic attraction one without the other, or neither of them. <laughs> as evidenced by myself and many others. <laughs> and start the mating process and send your DNA into tomorrow. This is from Catch My Fly. There are also many people who feel both sexual and romantic attraction and don't want kids. As simple as that. Do you believe in soulmates? If so, do you believe you can have more than one? From the way she is reading this out, I am going to assume she is morally tied to monogamy. I do believe in soulmates. I do not believe you can have more than one at a time. Wrong. <laughs> and I think soulmates aren't something really assigned. They're something you kind of work towards. Um, they have a good quote about that in The Good Place. Um, and I like their outlook on most things about human life. I think it's a really bright and positive way to look at that through a lens of comedy. Um, so, you know, watch The Good Place. You can absolutely have soulmates, you know, be it platonic or 
romantic, sexual, whatever. And you can absolutely have more than one at a time. Like, that's why polyamory <laughs> exists. You can, you can be in a poly relationship and absolutely equally love each and every one of them. No matter who you invite into it. So, provably false by witness and experience. So now what is a soulmate? I think what this person is, means is somebody who, it's a true love. You're not going to sleep with other people. You're not thinking of going anywhere. You might even consider dying for him or her. And that's modern normativity. The idea that love is this above all else, wonderful, world-changing magic. And it's a cool part of life, but it's not that important, man. You gotta learn to let it go. <laughs> you can have hobbies and find your life filled with wonder and meaning. And no matter if you feel attraction or not, if you end your life alone, that's fine. You can still be perfectly happy. And that's... It frustrates me. It breaks my heart. I don't know that it's such a mainstream opinion. Like, thousands of years people have truly believed that that's the penultimate of what you can do in life. You can live and die for your friends as well. Meaning is something that kind of pops up that's attached to emotion, and you don't really control or pick who those people are that mean a lot to you. Once again, I have people I really like. I really, really care about, want the best for, and like my friends, but there isn't that, you know, need to, you know, die for them, but plenty of people have that. I'm on a narrow waist Discord server, um, and I'm a moderator there, so if you want to join, you know, it's cool. Um, <laughs> shout out to them. But I've seen those people, and they absolutely love their friends. They care, and they feel that deep connection. And that's not exclusive to romantic love. Nor is it a necessity for life and joy. Best by a poet from the 15th century in India named Kabir. The lane of love is narrow. There's room for only one. Nope. <laughs> Indeed, when you're madly in love, it's with only one person. Nope. I think, that you I think that's a culturally Christian ideal. One of the things that makes cultural Christianity so frustrating. Like, I was raised culturally Christian. I'll be honest, I don't really believe in any sort of deity. Although I don't also believe that I'm the be-all, end-all. I don't know everything, you know. Whatever religion suits you is good and deserves to be celebrated and welcomed um, until it's forced on other people like cultural Christianity is. But it just proves that there's human bias. Science is the process of learning things about reality, but it cannot help but be interpreted by people. And you can read data wrong. <laughs> you know, the links and connections that you can make with science and study only go so far, and they're the best we have, so of course, you know. I'd rather have people interpret science wrong than just give up on it altogether, but assuming you're the authority on it and telling people there is only one way to be based on how you feel personally is incorrect. It's not an objective thought. We're all subjective beings. I lust hard and lose interest quick. How does that work? Well, they're not ready to fall in love. We no. <laughs> I lost heart and lose interest quick. I hate to tell you this, J53K1. You might want to look into being uh, aerospec. Because um, the first thing that brings to mind, which obviously you can choose any label you want, and I don't know the full situation, this is a very short snippet. If you like someone and start to lose interest, in a romantic sense, then it is possible you are fray romantic or lith romantic. How does that work? Well, they're not ready to fall in love. We've evolved. No. <laughs> they're not ready to fall in love. Falling in love is not a sign of maturity. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a thing that you can do. 
three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. One is the sex drive, linked with testosterone in both men and women. The second is romantic love. We've been able to prove this is linked with the dopamine system in both men and women. That's what gives you the focus, the motivation, the obsession. And the third brain system is attachment, that sense of calm and security you can feel with a long-term partner. I think that's well explained. That fits in with um, the split attraction model. There she says and verifies there are sexual feelings, romantic feelings, and platonic feelings of care, and they can all be mashed together in one person, what you feel for one person, but they can also be a variety of different, you know, you can experience each one on its own. And this individual, he's in the lust stage. He's not ready to fall in love. You know, you have to be ready to fall in love. From Reiki or Ray, hmm. how can you be in love with somebody and jealous of them? Easily. When you're madly in love with somebody, it's called mate guarding. Other animals do it too. And if you see your partner beginning to flirt with other individuals, you could lose that partner. I don't think that's what the commenter is suggesting. To me, it would imply being jealous of them as a person, not that they are sneaking off with someone else or they have the potential to. I think it's that feeling of both idolizing and loving someone, but also kind of wanting to steal what makes them so great, perhaps. Um, I confused a lot of crushes when I was younger as being crushes, first of all, because I felt um, the pressures of a modern normativity, even though I didn't realize that's what it was at the time. But I thought, I feel the same way for all the boys in my class that I do as my friends who are girls. Therefore, since they're guys and I'm a girl, that must be attraction. Because boys and girls can't just be friends. Um, which was incorrect. <laughs> but also, the people I looking back on, did not have a crush on, but thought I did, were people I envied their smartness. I envied how well they did in class. And my sort of, I guess, fantasy of what would happen when we get married. I had this weird assumption as a kid that I would just... Whenever I had a crush <laughs> on some kid, then I would imagine, I guess, that like, I'd skip over, you know, I'd figure we'd be married, but never thought about the details of that. Um, never thought about dating, never, I don't know, I just combined our last names and was like, that sounds good. And then figured we would both live in one place, uh, and then we'd each have our own separate bedrooms, obviously, because hearing someone snore would be super annoying. Um, and then figured that we would just like reconvene to do like research or something sciencey and smart and I would they'd be able to teach me whatever they know and I would be able to make myself the smartest I possibly could and learn everything. Which is for sure attraction. <laughs> Romantic love is definitely when you look at someone and go, I wish I could steal their powers. <laughs> but that's that is what they're asking, right? Be in love with someone and jealous of them. Question of the day, this person writes. Couples that do this together have 20% more love hormones. It's not dirty. Well, I don't know what this person has in mind, but I would say play. When you play with somebody, you're driving up the dopamine system in the brain, and that gives you focus, motivation, energy, and optimism. Play with somebody, stay with somebody. Definitely have fun in all your relationships. That's great advice. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's all the questions. I enjoyed answering them. Thank you for joining me. Till next time. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, I am not a biological anthropologist of love, but I am certainly an experiencer of a modern normativity from a different aspect perspective. So, I don't know. Maybe this got really long and rambly, but... Uh, thanks for watching, especially if you've made it this far, um, or if you're sort of skimming around and going through chapters. Uh, I do that too, watching it on times two. You know, that's my thing as well that I'm guilty of, so... Yeah!
thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time on the friend zone. That seems like a really bad idea. A lot of romantic gestures seem potentially dangerous and they're supposed to be like, oh, so cute, but like, bad idea. Anyway, <laughs> that's neither here nor there.